Hey, welcome to the Art Condition Podcast, a weekly show that will discuss the business, community, and often undiscussed stress and mental health concerns of being a professional artist or even a serious hobbyist. I'm Joby. I've been in the tattoo and illustration professions for 25 years. My co-host is Moose, a data analyst, social media manager, and art agent. If you enjoy the content, please consider visiting the Patreon page and the show notes to help support the effort. Or if that's not an option, please like, subscribe, leave a good review, or just share with your friends. And definitely go visit the links of our guests on this episode. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. This week, we are talking to Shane Swenson. Shane has been in the tattoo industry for many years and is now expanding his career to include oil painting and working in the fine art world. Because the genre he is most passionate about is Christian iconography, his market is a little different than the typical gallery setting, and so is his means of accessing that market. This offers some novel information about alternative methods of marketing artwork and the rewards and challenges of thinking outside the traditional lines. We start out talking about his tattoo career at length and take some time to discuss the peculiarities of the tattoo world, what it's like to get into the industry, why apprenticeships are so important, and how the industry is changing. Conversations like this where we explore the roads less traveled in the art world is really what I live for, and I look forward to having more conversations like this in the future. Let's listen. Say hello to Shane Swenson. What's up, man? Long cool, time man. no see. How are yeah. you? Good years, man. Good, good, good. How are you? Very appreciative for you to give us some time. Uh, I know you were a very busy person. Uh, I don't want to call you out, but five kids, man. I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed with your resiliency. Yeah. Not really, that really wasn't the plan, but you know, you know how things go. You know how that all happens. I don't have to fill in the blanks. But. Yeah, well, plans, what, uh, what plans? I don't know. That's, uh... well, I mean, some of the circles I run in, people plan on having huge families. And we, we didn't plan, like, I wasn't like, okay, we're going to have this many kids and whatever. Um, we just sort of, it's just one of those things that happened. We're not like against large families per se, but it sort of happened and yeah like i was telling you via text kids are amazing but i don't know it's just kind of like salt like when you dump out the whole thing on your food and it's just covered in salt then like it gets to be a little much sometimes i think kids are that way but at the end of the day i mean at least there's a positive with kids with salt you end up with like high blood pressure but i don't know with with my kids you you sort of if you were around them you would have high blood pressure too so maybe the analogy stands I think it does. It's actually kind of brilliant. I'm going to start using that. Um, But aside from kids, uh, we want to talk to you today about art. Um, I mean, I've known you for a long time now. um, Yeah. And I I know you as a tattoo artist, and I've only recently become aware of your productivity, your prolific productivity uh, as a fine art, an, an oil painter as well. So this is going to be a fun conversation to talk about sort of the contrast between those two things. Um, But before getting into that, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, How did you get into art generally and how did the ball and chain become permanently attached? Um, It's kind of weird because, I mean, I always like to draw. I mean, I think every artist, you know, when you ask them that question, they go, it's kind of hard to to nail down the exact moment that you realized you wanted to be an artist. I never, that really wasn't my intention when I was growing up. I was super into music. I've played guitar since I was like eight years old. And I've always, I've always loved guitar. Uh, And that was kind of my focus in middle school and high school. But I always, you know, I would always draw and stuff. And I was super into comic books. I think everybody most tattooers had a point in their life where where they were into comic books and illustrators in general um i used to get wizard you guys know wizard the the magazine wizard or whatever Mm -hmm. yeah i used to get that and obsessively stare at it and stare at the gen 13 boobies all the time if anybody knows about that comic um (laughs) and i was super into spawn all that stuff and so i would spend most of my time drawing comic books and stuff like that and I remember getting a D- 
distinctly remember getting in trouble. I think I was a freshman in high school, and I had a science teacher, a biology teacher, who semi humiliated me in front of the class. And it was it was almost like a scene out of a movie where you're doing something that you would end up making a career out of, but like in the future. But the teacher is doing that almost like that uh, Twisted Sister video. What are you gonna do with your life? Kind of thing. And it was totally that moment, and it's it's like branded in my in my mind. And I forget specifically what he said, but I'll never forget him saying, don't waste your time on this kind of stuff. You need to study, and you know, the usual crap they say. And um, that stuck with me. I, it wasn't some motivating factor. Like, I wasn't, like, drawing, like, I'll prove it. I'll prove you wrong, Mr. So-and-so. It was just something that stuck in the back of my mind. And um, anyway, so I, you know, I get done with high school, and I, I kind of stopped drawing when I was... Oh, about 18, when I just didn't have the, I didn't put forth the, the effort and the time to sit down and draw. I was mostly playing guitar and bumming around for about a year after high school. And then I joined the military. I was in the U.S. Army for four years. Um, and I, I didn't really draw or anything during my time in the military either. Uh, when I got out of the military, I started getting tattoos. And this was like 2002, 2003. And at that time, tattooing was sort of, I don't know, like, me and you have been in the tattoo industry for a, a similar, around a similar time. You know, I think you've been doing it longer than I have. I think, in fact, I know you have. Um, but it, it, we're both kind of of that, I think the term was the black t-shirt generation. Yeah, I'm sure, have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're kind of of that generation. I was sort of on the tail end of that. For anybody that doesn't know what that is, though, can you, what, what is that? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, I, I forget, I think I heard it from... Some tattooer said that, I don't know, Jack Rudy or one of these like big wig old school guys had said that everyone tattooing now is like a black t-shirt on and it, that we all, it was all kind of a, a uniform, like everyone looked the same, sort of like the, the ironic, I'm a punk rocker, but everyone at the show has the same exact uniform, you know, no, there's no individuality really, it's just another like, um, I don't know, consumer tribe, I guess you could say. But, I mean, that's being really cynical about it. And I, I don't think anyone's intention was to do that. But that's sort of the gist of the black t-shirt generation. And it was sort of on the tail end of when there was still a lot of biker-esque things going on. At least now this is just my experience. I know every tattooer has their own origin story. Uh, this is just mine. I came up in a shop that was... It was kind of a biker shop. Like the, the guy that owned it, his claim to fame. He's really cool. I'm not like throwing him under the bus. Um, he was kind of a big name in the 80s in, the, in Montana and in the Northwest. And his claim to fame was he tattooed Vince Neal and you know, that whole kind of Hessian butt rock kind of tattoo thing. That was his thing. So um, anyway, when I, when I first started getting tattooed when I got out of the military, uh, I remember getting a big piece on my arm. And at this time I was in a band and back then when you were in, I hate the term, but it's probably the only term anyone will understand is we were kind of like an, an emo core band. <laughs> you know, it's fun to laugh about now, but um, anyway, we were kind of in a band. Like I was kind of in a band like that. I was getting tattooed and I, I remember looking down and the guy that was tattooing me and I was looking at some of the drawings and I'm like, man, I could do, he was a good artist, but I, I was looking at the illustrations and some of the stuff that the other artists were doing in the shop, and I just had this moment where I'm like, I could do this. And another friend of mine had tried to do a tattoo apprenticeship, but he didn't really, he didn't really succeed. So he ended up becoming a piercer. It's a sort of a repeated story that I've heard throughout my career multiple times. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. Honestly, I, I never was. I never was focused on getting into tattooing. I don't want to say I fell into it because I, there was intentionality there, but it, it has to do with getting tattooed and being around it and, and seeing that there was a potential there. So, What was it about that environment that appealed to you? While you're there and you're getting tattooed and you're having that experience, what was the connection between like, okay, cool, I'm getting tattooed, this is a fun thing, I like these people, to like, oh, this is what will be the thing for me to do how I want to earn my living. Uh, part of it was I was, I was in a band and 
I was with my wife at the time, and I was in this band, and I worked at Guitar Center. And those being in a band and working at Guitar Center isn't really wasn't really the trajectory that I thought would really get me to the point where I could support a family. So that honestly was a necessity. I also worked at this other place too. <clears throat> and just, just, I don't know, just thinking about it, like this is something I could do. I have a, a foundation. I thought it was a lot better artist at the time than I actually was. I think all of us can attest to that. <clears throat> but I don't know. It, was, it wasn't really thought out. Um, I was just around it and getting tattooed, and I thought, I could, probably, I could probably do this. And I pursued it, and luckily the guy that was tattooing me was cool. He wasn't this arrogant... He, he was very... He was just cool. He was a down-to-earth guy. He wasn't a super arrogant artiste, tattooer, you know, like, uh, over-mystified everything. He was just... He was a, a just down-to-earth guy, so... He was the one that said, you can come here, and he said, I, can't, I don't know if I can offer you an apprenticeship, because I just work here, but you can come here and I'll show you some stuff. I'll, I'll, whatever I know, I'll show you. So I did that. You know, I started sweeping and doing all that stuff at the shop. But it was never, looking back now, I realized that it was never, there was never any intention of bringing me on as a tattooer. I feel like they were just sort of using me. The, the owner was just sort of using me as like a free janitor. And there was another artist there who took me aside. And what's funny is this other artist that actually helped me out the most was a complete asshole to me for a long time. And like he was, he was a complete asshole. And I remember him one day taking me to the side and saying, hey, you know, they're kind of using you here. You're never going to get, uh, you're never really going to have a job tattooing. He said, but I know a guy at a shop up north and they're looking for an apprentice. Why don't you take this stuff? that you've done, take some of the drawings, I'll talk to him and, and go meet him. And so I ended up going up to the shop and met the guy. Luckily, that guy was super cool. He's kind of like a biker tattooer, Cherry Creek kind of guy, you know what I mean? If anybody doesn't know what Cherry Creek means, it was it's a specific kind of tattoo flash. It was really popular in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And um, it's the sort of stuff, like you take a stack of it to Sturgis if you worked there, because it's that it had like Harley Davids and stuff. It's just that that kind of biker stuff that sells. So those are the kind of tattoos he did, and he had a really good name in town. Um, and he was cool. He wasn't a tattoo guy. He wasn't like a hipster, super cool tat bro. He was just this like '80s hair metal kind of butt rock dude who was real down to earth. If you've ever seen the movie Office Space, he was the hey man, the, the long haired <laughs> construction dude. That's that guy to a T. You know, his whole entire personality, he'd give you the shirt off his back. And I owe everything that I have now pretty much to that guy. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. I ended up apprenticing there, which turned into a real apprenticeship and a real job eventually after a little bit of time. So, uh, Tattooing is kind of unique among uh, all careers that I can think of. I'm probably missing one, but there's no real way to like purchase your education and there's no like standardized course or program that you can apply to, um, you know, or get enrolled in that's going to give you a job after you're done. It's like one of the last true apprenticeship trades. Why, why do you think that's been preserved for so long? Why do you think that continues to be the case? Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, well, before I answer that, I'll say that those days are probably coming to an end because I don't want to say it's because of regulation, not fully, but I, I don't know. I don't want to say it's because of overregulation, but I, I sort of see eventually, like at least in Washington state and maybe Oregon and other states that are, that are hyper regulated or or taxed, um, I see there being inevitably some sort of board or something like that, like they have with cosmetology. I think inevitably that's sort of what's in the cards, especially now seeing some of the regulations they're putting on ink in Europe and how big corporations are getting involved. I think, I think what me and you experienced was sort of, it's sort of a period of the tattoo industry that is going to go away eventually. And a lot of people are fighting that, but 
which which I agree with. But I, I just think, just like everything, it's 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 everything's going to be hyper corporatized, if I could use that word. So after having said that, <clears throat> I will say that part of the reason why I think it's been preserved up until today is because. For me personally, I, I think there's two reasons. Number one, there's always been sort of like this esoteric mystique about tattooing. And I don't know if that comes from the roots of tattooing in general. Why, in a lot of cultures, it's like a spiritual thing. It's a, it's a rite of passage. It's something that is connected to some sort of acceptance in the tribe or what you know, whatever. It's, it has some sort of deeper deeper meaning than just I want to look like a badass you know I'm not saying everybody that gets tattooed today does it for those reasons but um, it's a it's less superficial in a traditional context is what I'll say so I don't know if that has something to do with it or the fact that most tattooers have have a have either a a personality defect that <laughs> makes them socially awkward and I don't know. I mean, I know that's with me. Part of the reason I'm a tattooer is because I don't think I could be successful in like a corporate job or like any other context besides being a tattooer or an artist because I would just, I mean, you can probably relate. It's, it's soul crushing to even think about being caged into a wage cage like that. But I don't know. Honestly, the, I think it's just been a part of the, the apprenticeship thing has just been so so much a part of tattooing that it's sort of a rite of passage and nowadays i don't think getting an apprenticeship is as hard or even nearly as hard as it was when me and you sort of began our our journey or whatever got into tattooing i had a relatively easy time getting an apprenticeship but a lot of that was luck and the first six months i essentially like i said i essentially swept the floor for some like you know, jerk off that was basically taking advantage of some young guy that thought he was getting something from it. And I've heard that story a lot, but um, I don't know. I think it's just something that's been preserved. And a lot of, a lot of apprenticeships, you eat a lot of shit, meaning you, if, if it's a shop full of a lot of guys, you're the guy that goes and gets everybody's lunch. You're the guy that sometimes sets everybody up and breaks everybody down, that cleans the tubes. The tubes are, I'll explain what a, a tube is. Uh, it's like a metal. It's a piece of metal with a, a grip, a hand, like a, something you hold on to, and it's it's the apparatus that the needle goes into that you hold that connects to the machine. That's a tube. Um, there's all that stuff. You you you're for lack of a better term, you're the, you have a period of time where you're the bitch, and it's not like being an intern at a corporation. Although I have heard of some bigger tattoo shops and companies run it sort of like an internship, but if you go to like a traditional shop. I've heard stories of guys that would get beat up. I mean, I'm not saying that's okay, but getting pushed around. I mean, that, that's, that's not, that wasn't uncommon. It's not common now, but anyway, it just becomes sort of a rite of passage as a tattooer. And that's almost like basic training in the military. It's a period of time that really sucks where you don't know anything. Everyone thinks you're an idiot. You screw up a bunch of stuff. But if you make it through that, if you make it through that basic training phase, the rewards are is you know that you you end up with this career and you're able you're you're gifted the privilege to tattoo. And I don't think a lot of people that aren't tattooers realize that you don't. I mean, nowadays like, I keep I hate that I keep saying this that nowadays it's different, but it's it, again it's it's not as crazy as it was when you and I got into tattooing it was a lot more difficult than it is today. But I don't know. I think it's just such, such a part of the culture that people don't want to forego that. And I think rightly so. It's something that should stick around. I don't believe that there should be tattoo schools. I mean, you know as well as I, anytime a tattoo school pops up, there's a huge backlash from the entire industry, and rightly so. And that's sort of a protective mechanism to protect the apprenticeship, the traditional apprenticeship. Um, and there's, I don't know, there, there's a lot of negativity around trying to make it so that while you're getting your education as a tattooer, you do it 
via some other company or whatever. No, it's you have to almost you almost have like a sensei, like the artist that you that you're under that teaches you. And if you if you apprentice under a certain artist that has a lot of a big following and is really talented, I mean that's that's something that you can wear with pride your entire career. Like I I apprenticed under so and so. And I mean, it's just like any other industry, you know, if you're, if you apprenticed, even in cosmetology or any kind of apprentice situation, if you're a cobbler, you know, and you make shoes uh, and you apprenticed under some big shot Italian shoemaker, it opens a lot of doors for you. And I also think that's, that's a part of it as well. So kind of long winded, but that's my, my theory. Long winded is fantastic. Um, The the crappy grunt work that you were talking about and even to yeah. some degree that the hazing which there's like I mean, there's definitely you know a line where hazing can go too far and i don't approve okay. of anybody getting you know beat up or you know like the any kind of like violent type hazing um you know right. but some of the like more <laughs> shall we say uh good natured hazing <laughs> people will hear about even that stuff and be like you know wow that just sounds crappy you know and like it it seems like a justification in itself, but I think it's important to think about it in a certain context, you know, which is that in the apprenticeship, uh, in the mentor mentee relationship within tattooing, there's a huge amount of trust that right. has to come into play. Um, you know, there's a lot of reputation that's in stake in an ideal situation, you know, which if you're getting right. an apprenticeship, hopefully you're doing it, you know, the, the right way that, so there's a lot of trust involved on the part of the person that's teaching you, their reputation is on the line. They want to be sure that you're going to carry this torch forward in a meaningful way and like, you know, represent their legacy for lack of a less grandiose terminology. But um, so, I mean, there's like a, yeah, like the fight club aspect of it that is kind of a placeholder for uh, that trust development. You know, like right. you, you, that has to be seen first and like and, and ultimately you end up with the golden ticket. You know, there's like exactly. when, when you become a tattoo artist, there's no like upward level really to like what you can accomplish other than y- your your own amb- ambition. Um, the 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 changing sands, the shifting sands of that are interesting, you know, as far as the regulation that you were talking about goes, because. I mean, for as long as tattooing has been self-regulated, it's done pretty well. It's done a pretty good job of yeah. keeping its shit together in that regard. And it's weird that it's like just now everybody is like trying to pile on the regulation. And, but it's even it's hard for me to imagine how you would totally do away with the the apprenticeship scenario because there has to be some kind of. Uh, personalized experience, some kind of like one-on-one with the teacher and the right. student. It's hard for me to imagine that going away completely. Well, I'm wondering why, right? Because as an outside, you guys are the tattoo artists of the group, and I'm sitting here saying, you know, concept art, fine art, uh, illustration, what have you, none of those have apprenticeships anymore. So right. what uh, people from going to YouTube, learning everything there is to know about tattooing, get a bunch of pigskin and practice on the pigskin and then set up a shop. Why do they need an apprenticeship? Well, that, that kind of leads into what, I, what I'm getting at. Um, <clears throat> it's almost like what I think will happen is because of the Internet and like what you said, people can watch these videos. There's people that are, ta- that have been, that are self-taught tattooers, generally self-taught tattooers, uh, that have been tattooing like two, three years that, that blow anything I could do out of the water, you know, and that's, I mean, what we, maybe we'll get into the standards of tattooing and how they're climbing and the reason for that, maybe in another point here down the road when we're talking, but as far as this goes, you're right. That's kind of what I mean. Um, it's almost like it'll maybe go to an atelier or something where like you go and you go to the Florence Academy of art and there's several well-known artists that run this atelier and you go there and that's your pedigree. I could see tattooing doing something like that, but it would need, you would need to get people behind it that not only have credibility uh, outside in maybe the, the broader mainstream context, but also within the tattoo industry. I'm not going to mention names, but there are people who, well, maybe I'll mention a few because it's not, there's nothing negative, but 
there are people like who I who I respect, like Tim Hendricks, Mike Rubendahl. There are guys who are very even like Mario Barth. There are people who have capitalized on the commercial popularity of tattooing, but they did it in the right way. You know, so they go on the TV shows, but they're good ambassadors for tattooing. They're not they're not doing it for purely personal motivation or personal gain. Whereas there are definitely some people that have done that. But I think people like that um, are good to have, not only not only because not only because it gives tattooing a, a good image, but those are sort of the vanguard of people. They're generally leaders in our industry, not just not just artistically and with their you know with their artistic influence, but they're leaders in a business sense. Those are some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the tattoo industry. And I think one of the things I respect most about a lot of those guys, not all of them, but most of those guys, is that they've done a damn good job at keeping tattooing true to its roots and legit. And at the same time, being that vanguard and almost that, for lack of a better term, they're like the bouncers that are kind of keeping some of the big corporate assholes away as long as possible. It's inevitable that we're not going to be able to hold this off forever. But they're sort of buying us time by interacting with that. The reason I say that is because we, um, I don't follow a lot of tattoo industry stuff. I'll just be honest. I'm sort of disconnected from the industry in that way. But I did, I, because of a couple guys I work with, I was privy to the, the European, the ink ban in the EU. They banned like certain colors, which is just mind-bogglingly stupid. You know, and they found out that the reason why was because Revlon or some big cosmetic company is behind or lobbying behind that in order to come in and then create the ink that they have to use. And they have some proprietary blend or something. You know what I mean? It's it, it's just it's just the world we live in. So seeing the behavior of some of the, these guys, uh, uh, Henning, Henning Jorgensen, Mario Barth, a lot of the well-known, respected European tattooers, seeing how they have been able to deal with that, I think, is a good predictor of when the apprenticeship, I don't want, it will never go away, but when the apprenticeship morphs into, like what, what you were saying, the atelier kind of thing, or just the online thing, um, I don't know, I think, I think it's a good idea to at least have those kind of people involved in it. Because in my opinion, it's inevitable. I've, I worked with a guy who's a fantastic tattooer, insanely good realism tattooer, who didn't do an apprenticeship. He just bought machines. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not encouraging anyone watching this to do that. That's, that's the worst possible way to do it. And unless you are in, insanely gifted and talented and have other tattooers in your life at your disposal to guide you, you're going to ruin people's lives. You're going to hurt people and... It's really a bad idea. This guy, though, he was my friend, and he had other friends that were tattooers. So he didn't do an apprenticeship, but I mean, I would, I helped him. He was my buddy. So there's, there's definitely multiple paths up the tattoo mountain, but the old school, like you were saying, get hazed, go get lunch, you know, work 85 hours a day or whatever, you know, like these insane demands. I think that is going to go away. Um, and turn it, it's going to turn more into a, a, an internship, like a professional internship. I even know guys that had to sign contracts when they did their, their not just non-compete contracts, like legit contracts that they had to work for a certain amount, or they had to pay for their apprenticeship, but they had to pay it off via a lower percentage or whatever. So I don't know. I mean, the, the more notoriety we get as, t as tattooing grows more and more and becomes more mainstream, it's just inevitable that... There's no stasis. It's not going to maintain. And I don't know. Yeah, I wasn't one, one note. It, wa it wasn't me that mentioned the atelier thing. You mentioned the atelier thing. Uh, and I think that that's, oh. a, that's a great way. Yeah, yeah but, it's, oh. but it's awesome that you did because I, I think that's a great way to think about you know the possible future of it. Um, I think the, the atelier approach could uh, substitute the traditional apprenticeship methodology you know in, in that you would have uh, um a school of a sort but i mean 
I mean, there's a reason like why the Atelier uh, uh, program isn't called, you know, like painting school, you know, or like art school in, in the in the same way that you can take like art classes or whatever from some other right. places that are known as art schools. And I, I think that the Atelier process also speaks to the question that Moose was asking, you know, like, why can't you just buy machines off the Internet and, you know, just start tattooing and why can't it be like, uh, you know, concept art or illustration or, or other forms of visual art? And I, I think some other things that I would I totally agree with everything that you said, Shane. And there were only a couple of things that, that I would add to that um, in that there is like a necessity for a sort of closer hands on part of the process that has to be there. Um, and in that it could be like a, a con it could represent like a going to concept art school as long as like your teachers your mentors are going to have that in place that's one thing another thing is that uh there's another living human being that has to be on the other right. end of your canvas you know where concept art and things of that nature i can practice in my own home in a complete vacuum as long as i have electricity and the right machinery Tattooing, right. I mean, it, it necessitates a relationship between two individuals. Um, and there has there's a way that you have to sort of like cultivate your way into those relationships. Um, even if it's just your friends, you know, like there's 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 community aspects to it that would be hard to represent in or, or, or replicate in a scenario like you know cgma you know or like some of the other like kind of like online situations right uh, there's also the aspect of it being self-propelled it's almost inherently entrepreneurial you know because there's no like no like well maybe this will change too but tattoo artists aren't getting w2 forms you know like we're not like hired right. and fired in the same way you know of like you know more traditional occupations um and so it's like learning a lot of that um that business sense you know what it's like to run a tattoo shop or or run a tattoo business as even just as an individual like every individual tattoo artist sort of is their own business what does that look like how does that work right. and of course the biohazard aspect of it <laughs> you gotta like Correct. make sure people Correct. aren't like poisoning themselves or or yeah. other people um but uh uh, bringing this back, uh, you mentioned something that that maybe we would get to, but let's get to it. You talked about the rising standards of of tattooing. What were you uh, where were you going with that? Maybe take that tangent for a second. OK, yeah, I think. Well, I'll start with this. Tattooing, we're in the middle of a, ta a renaissance in tattooing. It's you could arguably say that it started years and years and years ago. Um, and I, I guess, I guess it did. I think it started somewhere in the late eighties, early nineties. And what I mean by Renaissance is that everything has improved, has progressively gotten better and better since about that time frame. I mean, the technology behind the machines we use, the pigment, the barriers from a medical standpoint, the things that we use for aftercare to heal the tattoo, I mean, everything has sort of been on this upward trajectory as far as quality and just being better overall. And what I saw personally, now the technology is continually improving, obviously. I mean, the machine I use now is, I mean, I use cartridges. I do, I do black and gray realism, so mostly. And um, so I use cartridges. Cartridges are basically the, the tattoo needle is it's a literal cartridge and the machine is i'll hold the machine you just plug it in and i can use all different could just think of it imagine if you had a paintbrush with different types of brushes you could plug in that anyway i don't know but um i think i think the most important aspect just like every other industry out there uh, not just tattooing art in general because of the internet things have People are able to see and access the work of other people instantaneously, whether that's Instagram, Facebook, and whatever, I don't know, forums, Discord, whatever, Twitch. People are able to access information being other people's artwork. And 
you're able to access instructional information. Basically, you could teach yourself, mostly teach yourself to tattoo. Um, I'd say you, you could get 70% of the way there just by watching YouTube videos and, and stuff, DVDs you could buy online. You, but there's about 30% that you, you just can't teach yourself if you want to be, if you want to do it right. And not just do it right, but I feel like if you go into an industry and you don't respect what is sacred right out of the gate, you're going to have a tough time. And that apprenticeship thing is sort of sacred, I would say, to a lot of people because any of us who went through that, it's like showing up if you're in the military and you, you're like, oh, I'm going to show up to this unit, but I never did basic training. It's like, well, you're not really going to have the skill set. You might have gone out in the woods and shot guns and some, you know, some asshole taught you how to do whatever, but you didn't go through the same rite of passage. And that's something that's considered sacred in the tattoo industry to people who matter and people that really care about this industry. So if you didn't do that right out of the gate, you're not going to have credibility and you're not going to be respecting the norms of and standards of the industry. So that's my little quip about that as well. But as far as the rise in quality and the progression of tattooing, for me personally, Instagram, I hate to say it, I think has improved the overall worldwide quality of tattooing a hundredfold. And it's what it's done also is it's raised the bar to what is now considered the almost like the, the median expectation of clients. Like it, or, or anything. I mean you can really apply this to any art illustration, whatever. But it, it really for me the first the first thing that, or the first aspect of this that personally impacted me was tattooing. And it was a good thing and a bad thing because it's a good thing because I think it's, it's a great way to source inspiration. It's a great way to see where the bar is and where, where, where you have to get if you want to be considered a professional. Like you have, to, you have to continually work on what you're doing so that you can meet and exceed that standard technically and creatively um and tattooing definitely has experienced this the kind of stuff i was doing 10 years ago i that everyone all my clients and people thought was amazing like i look at it now and it just doesn't meet the basic standard of like i said i do black and gray realism that's what i do and if i were to do what i was doing 10 years ago now i mean it would be really hard for me to have the clientele i have so um, that being said, Instagram and social media is the reason for this boom and this hyper renaissance of the quality of tattooing. And it's a good thing for all of us as artists because it, 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 it keeps the momentum going and it makes things look better and better. The tattoos are just getting insanely amazing. Uh, and for, I think the people that win the most are clients because the tattoo that you're getting now from, you could walk into pretty much any shop, even the you know, the lowest of the low, um, it's almost hard to get a bad tattoo now, as far as technically speaking. Like you might get something that's not drawn well or the design principles are off. And it, but, but generally, technically speaking, um, it's hard to get a messed up tattoo where the pigment doesn't go into the skin and you have all this like scar tissue. Like those days I really think are coming to a close. Some of, not fully, not totally. But even the worst places around here are doing tattoos that technically are applied generally pretty well to where the average person would be satisfied with it. Um, but as far as the, when you get past that aspect and into design and the, the foundational elements that you need to have to produce a tattoo that is what I would call world class, something that can compete with everyone doing professional quality stuff today, um, it's just insane what it is in all genres of tattooing, from black and gray to traditional. I look at some traditional tattoos now of people who would be, and I don't mean this as a pejorative, but like no name people who they don't have a massive following. Like, I mean, I, I'm a no name tattooer, you know, like I consider myself that. Um, people who just do are maybe big fish in a small pond kind of thing. Um, and the stuff they're doing is just insane. How clean the line work is, how, how solid the color is. I, I'm just blown away by it um, in all genres. So I think 
those are kind of the good aspects of this whole technology renaissance or yeah, technology technological advance and renaissance the bad aspect i think as an artist no matter if you're a tattooer or you focus on painting or illustration or whatever i think we can all relate to this where the human mind wasn't meant to absorb as much information as we are absorbing now in modern life like the amount of input that goes in not just visually but mentally and how let's say you're thumbing through somebody's portfolio and you're just it's like the shotgun of amazing stuff it's so it can be demoralizing i think everybody's experienced that where you think like you, you just did a painting or a drawing or whatever or a commission for someone and you knocked it out of the park and everyone around you says you did an amazing job and you feel really good about it, you know, for that few minutes when you're done before you hate it. <laughs> um, and then you go the next day or an hour later and you look at someone's stuff and you're just like, you can't even wrap your mind around how they could even begin to conceptualize something like that. Like, um, you, do you guys know who Jeff Watts is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff Watts. Okay. He's, he's a great salesman for his school, but... Jeff Watts, um, I remember, well, it's it probably about a year ago, I was, I was really, I think I did like a, I think I did like a painting workshop DVD or something, and I was like, man, I'm really, I'm really getting this, I'm really starting to get it. And then I started to explore some of the educational content that Jeff, Jeff Watts puts at Watts Atelier, and it just, it was demoralizing in a way, because I had this fantasy that I'm going to work really hard and move into doing contemporary art. You know, not knowing that if you think tattooing is competitive, the contemporary art world is like, you have to have, you have to not only be this amazing artist, you have to believe your own press. You have to have some like smoke and mirrors bullshit around who you are. I mean that in the best possible way. You have to sort of have a brand and be on all the time in order to succeed in that world. And, so it was seeing somebody like, like him, who's just a guy that teaches painting and drawing and illustration, and seeing, seeing what you have to know to do that, it was kind of demoralizing. And I realized how, how little talent and or how little skill I really had. So I think that's a negative aspect of it. If you allow that to overshadow what you're doing and if you if you have an obsessive sort of mind like i do i have kind of an obsessive personality whenever i get into something i have this almost compulsion that i have to do it until i master it or at least reach a high level um and it, i don't know why that's just i have kind of tunnel vision when i do that so if you're someone like me and you have i think every artist has that to a degree if you're doing it professionally you, you kind of have to have that unhealthy fixation on what you're doing but in a negative way, if you're, if, you're, if you're experiencing all this input and all of these various incredible artists, not just a few good artists, but you're able to see and feast upon the collective portfolio of everyone in whatever field you're in at the same time on Instagram. I can go and look at, and what you're, you're not seeing the stack of 20 paintings in the corner or the garbage tattoos they didn't take a picture of because we've all done them. Um, you're seeing the very best of their work and kind of a, a little bit of a rabbit trail that, that is connected to this. My wife was a, a professional blogger for several years and meaning she made a, a living off of her blog and it was, she did a lot of like beauty stuff and mom centered stuff. Um, and she was fairly successful with it. And one of the things that caused her to hang it up and totally disassociate from that and walk away is. I don't want to say the realization because I think she knew this all along, but accepting, finally accepting and not being in denial about the fact that everything you're seeing is bullshit. All of it. Like, it's different with art, I think, because you're seeing something tactile that's real that they created. But again, you're not seeing the stack. Like I could show you back over there, the stack of canvases and panels of just atrocious garbage that, I left over there. Um, I have a really terrible, when I first began painting iconography, which hopefully we'll get into, I have something that I hang, I'll show you, I'm not ashamed of it. I have this that I hold on to. 
it's terrible. My wife said it, it looks like uh, George Michael in drag. Like, it's this really terrible painting. I tried to do this icon of Christ, and I didn't really know how to paint. I didn't really know anything. And it turned out horrible. But I hold on to it, and I, I have it hanging up here in my studio um, just, just to keep me grounded and to keep me aware of where I came from. Also to prove to people that talent doesn't exist. I don't believe in talent. I believe in hard work and mental illness, basically. The talent <laughs> isn't really a thing. But anyway, um, yeah, I'll show you real quick that horrible, atrocious. It's, it's really bad. How but old anyway, is that? What's up? How old is that? Oh, this is probably about eight years old now. Something like that. Seven, eight years old. Um, but anyway, back to tattooing. Um, I think that if you're not careful with what you're consuming and you're just constantly consuming other people's tattooing, you almost become deluded and you get lost in this fantasy and you, you take on what's called imposter syndrome and you feel like what you're doing has no value. What you're doing will never be as good as tattooer A or B or artist A or B. And if you're not careful, it'll cause you to despair and quit what you're doing. And like I said, ta talent is BS. I don't believe in talent. I believe that some people have an aptitude and a good foundation, but I don't think people are innately... Like, I think anyone can learn to paint. Now, can anyone learn to be a world-class, really influential painter? Well, obviously not. But everyone can, can become competent at painting. Um, but if you, if you consume other people's output constantly, it will actually have a negative impact on you. So I think you need to learn, I think you need to learn how much you can take in before that starts to happen. Because a little bit of that's good. You want to see what other people are doing. You want to see what the standard is. And you want to get inspiration from that stuff. But at the same time, you don't want to be, you don't want it to totally be this barrier so that you give up and you become upset that you'll never get there um use that negativity to drive yourself like think think of yourself as as rocky up in the mountains you know punching the bag getting ready to fight the big bad russian guy that's kind of how i think of it when i see something i go i want to learn to do that it makes me feel bad that i don't know how to do that but at the same time i try not to dwell on it and i try to take it in and go okay let's say i see a tattoo from so and so and I, I like to sit and dissect and back engineer how they did it. So like, especially with black and gray tattooing, black and gray tattooing in general has, has had a renaissance. A lot, of, a lot more people are doing what, what I call high contrast black and gray, meaning we're, we're using more black, more skin tone to create high contrast so that the tattoo ages really well and is striking. Um, so anyway, yeah, trying to figure that out a few years ago, I was seeing this amazing high contrast tattooing coming out, mostly coming out of Southern California. Imagine that. Um, and seeing just this insane work being done and feeling really bad about my tattooing and having this gut check, this reality check that this is now the standard. It's never going to go back down. People aren't going to accept what I'm doing forever. And the jig will be up someday. So if I want to continue to have a career, I need to meet this standard or at least figure out how the hell they're doing it so that I can try to meet the standard. And I think as an artist and a tattooer, if, if you don't think that way, you're doing yourself a disservice and I think you're, you're not doing it right. I, I don't, I, I'm not saying you have to do it exactly in that way. And I think every successful artist has this thought process in, in their own way. Um, it's sort of that healthy competition thing. And the fact that us as artists, and I think tattooers more specifically, but artists in general, we affix our self-worth to, the, to our, what we put out. And so if you, I think that's why a lot of tattooers have a hard time getting criticism or critique. I had to learn how to take critique. And it hurts sometimes, but I had to learn how to take critique and not take it personal. Um, I'm pretty good at it, but sometimes, you know, somebody will say something and it's like, it, it kind of hurts, but you know it's because it's true, because you're insecure about it. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of rambled there, but Instagram and technology and the accessibility of information are why tattooing is where it is 
today. Yeah, that's, that's pretty consistent across the different fields. Like, uh, let's talk about uh, fantasy art, for example. When D and D was first getting started, it was literally co- high school and college kids who had no art background that were doing the illustrations for those books, and that was official D and D work. Those people today would not be able to get a job, let alone yeah. that job. Right. And uh, if you were to look at like Larry Elmore's uh, old stuff, you know, he's you've done great work. Uh, no one's going to take it away from him. But at, yeah. if he was to use the work that he was using uh, back when he started doing that, uh, his D and D and uh, Magic the Gathering st- uh, early affiliate fantasy art, it would not be in the running for the top of today. Right. So even the best of back then aren't even middle class of today. Well, what? I, let me ask you because that's obviously that's something you're into. Where do you think it ends? Like, I don't personally. I don't believe in perpetual progress in any what applied to any facet of art, society, space travel. Like, I think there's a point where you can't really progress past a certain point. And so, I, with art specifically, I kind of wonder, or tattooing, or, or fantasy illustration, where does it end? Like, what, at what point do we go, okay, we can't really get any better? I don't know. What's going to happen is it's going to be more and more people getting into it, and more and more people being rejected by it. Right. So that it's going to be like the survivors that are then pushing the envelope further. So it, even though the, uh, maybe the overall skill level increases by a little bit it's gonna be a lot of people that are getting washed out that would have quote unquote dragged down the uh the average but they then since leave the industry for something else because they can't compete anymore i would i would add to that the uh a larger cycle a larger cyclical context for that um whereas you know uh, rather than there being like some end point or like um you know infinity point just as you're likening the current state of tattooing to a renaissance, we can think about the actual renaissance and how, right. you know, that sort of like raised the bar to a point where it's like, I, I, well, for, you know, Western civilization anyway, about as high as it was going to get. Um, and then that became like the standard for quote unquote fine art. And um, that carried us through until like the forties and fifties. And then you had right. the Dadaists come in and, you know, and, and then, you know, shortly after that, the, um, you know, the cubists and people that wanted to destroy art, so to speak, you know, not in like this sort of anarchistic tear it down sort of way, but, um, it was kind of like a rejection of this like old conservatism of what art is supposed to look like or what good art is supposed to look like. Um, and, turned all of these like presumptions and assumptions and standardizations completely over shook the whole thing up and then art went through this period of kind of remodernization um you know literally having a postmodern period you know and a modernist period and then art deco and then it's now it's kind of i don't know depending on who you talk to it's coming like more the fine art the more sort of uh you know figurative and realism is maybe starting to come back on the un- incline tattooing could have the same sort of thing you know where it hits this sort of like peak of um quality or a certain you know a certain type of quality and you're even seeing starting to see that a little bit with like the real minimalist tattoos or the people that like ha- like hand poking where you're just like literally using your hand with like one of these like free floating tattoo needles and doing right. like these crappy little stick and poke tattoos but people are charging like five hundred dollars for these tiny little like yeah. nub, nubby tattoos because you, as you said you know like hipsters are really getting into it so i don't know like it's i kind of see like these sort of like cycles and and movements happening um so coming next would be the uh, how to draw manga for tattoo artists <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Remember that book yeah and that was you a know, terrible and- deformed manga character on the cover Anyway. Totally. And and that comes back to what we were talking about before, you know, as far as like how it could go into this period of 
um, mass production of the tattoo artist, you know, uh, yeah. and hopefully it will be in an atelier sort of fashion. Um, and that it reminds me of one thing that, that you said backtracking quite a bit, you know, you spoke of the, the sacred aspects, some of the sacred aspects of tattooing. And I did want to address that just because it could be easy for people to dismiss a comment like that, you know, like, well, what does sacred mean? Is it sacred just because it's sacred? But there is, there is a, a, I think, a value to thinking of things that are um, inherently valuable. But what's underneath that is that relationship, you know, the relationship between the teacher, the student, and the person that's being tattooed. That's right. that's that's human. There's there's human capital there, and that's the sacred aspect of it. And when you're learning tattoo, it requires this relationship between you and the person that you're tattooing. And then this like immediate, you have to have this immediate input and feedback from the person that's teaching you. Um, very hard to replicate in any sort of way outside of like a communion of people, people that are in this very right. unique sort of experience. And we're all experiencing this, this thing at the, at the same time. I don't know if you had anything to add after yeah. that. <laughs> well, a couple things. Yeah, I think I I like how you related how you related sort of the decline of Western art in the middle of the 20th century. Because if you look throughout, I mean, philosophy sort of went through a period like that. And now uh, a friend of mine's a, a philosophy professor, and I'm not. I'm, I sort of have a, I have a working knowledge when it comes to philosophy, but whenever I talk to him about it, it it's interesting to see the parallels, it, not just in art, but in all aspects of culture and society and how art sort of, what's that, does art imitate life or do, you know, that kind of cliche, does life imitate art or whatever. And I see, I see almost a, Oh, I don't want to say like a willful deconstruction, but there was a, there, kind of a willful deconstruction of things and then a rediscovery of the value in co coherence in art in general. And as far as that, that applies to tattooing, um, I don't know. It, tattooing is weird be, in some ways because it's... <clears throat> It's, it's so broad, and there are sacred aspects of it if you want to talk about it, like, like in the context you were about, about these relationships and these shared experiences with people in a meaningful way, going all the way back to not just the guy that's teaching you how to tattoo, but the guy that taught him how to tattoo, and all, kind of all the way back. There is this, I didn't really mention that, there is this aspect of a lineage and that's a, that's a lot more that's that's more valued in a in a culture like Japan and like Japanese tattooing. The apprenticeship thing is very it's almost smart. It's almost like a martial art. Like it, just like everything that the Japanese approach, it's very thought out and intentional. Like everything is intentional, and there's an extremely sacred element to all of that. So you, you have that aspect of it. Even in Western tattooing, you have that aspect of it. But there's also kind of the consumer aspect of it, and not obviously the 19-year-old girl, no offense, or boy, whatever, like the 19-year-old young person that comes in that wants to get what I call a memento tattoo, like a tattoo that's a date with a little symbol, or, you know, whatever, like, those are cool, I have some of those, there's nothing wrong with that. But not, not someone that's coming in that's wanting some experience and to like have some tattoo that exemplifies their life story or any kind of deep meaning, they want to get like a memento tattoo on their finger or their hip or whatever. They're not coming in thinking, I want to experience some sort of communion with the, the you know, they're not thinking like that. They're just wanting to purchase a, a service or a product. But that being said, if you completely negate the, what you were talking about and totally take that out of, tattooing and corporatize it and just turn it into this production thing um i just don't think it'll survive to be quite honest i personally don't think i think tattooing it's on the upswing and i think culturally just like everything culturally the pendulum is gonna sort of swing back my son is seven almost 17 and I know a lot of his friends are not interested in tattoos. 
you know, what, what's considered countercultural becomes the mainstream. And then the main, you know, whatever is opposed to the mainstream, the man, is now countercultural. I'm not getting into anything political. I refuse to talk about that stuff. But in general, even, even as art goes, like, tattooing isn't always going to be this popular. Okay? It's not always going to be, it might get even more popular, but the more popular and the more mainstream it gets, it's going to lose some of the inherent value that makes it so magical and, and, and gives it so much of that allure and that, that, that mystique that I think draws a lot of people to it. Um, I don't know, but that being said, when the pendulum swings back, well, when it's at its apex, um, it, 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 I think we're going to reach that point where the standard is going to be so high technically and artistically that people who would have been world-class knocking it out of the park 20 years ago or 10 years ago can't even get into the industry and maintain a clientele. I see that sort of happening now. And I tell people that ask me, how do I get an apprenticeship tattooing? I say, you need to be a better all-around artist than anyone that you know personally. And if you, if you are better than everyone you know personally, you don't know anyone. That, you, you don't know the right people, okay? My point, I mean, that kind of doesn't make any sense, but my point is that the tattoo world has enough mediocre artists and tattooers. And it's getting to the point now where once that pendulum swings back, some of the business is going to dry up, and it's going to weed out people that aren't doing really spectacular stuff and forward-thinking stuff. Um, there's always going to be a place for people getting small memento tattoos, but even then, like, the industry is going to be a lot harder to get into. So, I don't know. I, th I think that's a good point you made about maybe, maybe it's more of a, a cyclical thing as opposed to some point A to point B, we hit a point, you know, the, the, we hit, like, we cannot get any better. I'll, I'll, for example, guitar. I've played guitar my entire life. And I remember, do you know who Ingve Malmsteen is? Do either of you guys know who that is? Oh, okay. yeah. Ingve, I was, I was super into shred, shred guitar. And this was in the 90s when it wasn't, that wasn't cool. It wasn't cool to be into shred guitar. And I remember sending away for CDs from Shrapnel Records and try, trying to scrounge up all this stuff, buying Hot Licks videos, because the internet didn't have a lot of this stuff. And I thought I got pretty good. <clears throat> well, Nowadays, kids can go online and absorb all of this instructional stuff. And I, there's kids that have been playing guitar for a year that are just, I mean, I don't even have words for it. They're technically amazing. Like, guitar players now, if you go on, just go on YouTube, the ability, the technical ability of most guitarists is just out of this world. Like, I, I couldn't even imagine reaching that as a kid or even now. Um, so it's getting to the point now where it's like, okay, you can play really fast and you're technically really good, but what, it, it focuses more on the melodic content of the music now. There's a lot more of a focus on fusion or jazz or more melodic-based music that's also virtuosic. And I think art's going to reach that point too, and then have to have, or tattooing, and then have to have sort of a deconstruction, whether that's economically like a, a real economic deconstruction where people just stop getting tattoo, tattooed mainstream and it's a small group of people that we used to have in like the 70s, let's say. Like when Ed Hardy was doing his thing and really pushing things forward um, and establishing a lot of what would become standards later in our industry. Uh, God, that sounds like I'm kissing his ass, doesn't it? I'm not at all. I don't know Ed Hardy. I just, I just really I, I admire him for what he did. But anyway. Um, I think that that's more likely, you're right, that there's going to be, the mainstream appeal is going to sort of become passe, or it's just going to become like sort of a thing over here that some people do. And when, when the dust settles and everything calms down and people scatter and go off and do other things and less people are trying to get a piece of the pie, I think the cycle starts over again. And then we figure out where we can, where we can take it in that, that aspect. If we're not all you know, completely dead. And that was <laughs> just, <laughs> knock, anyway, knock on wood. What you yeah. just said about uh, music uh, brought up another point where we have a lot of people that are you know, working in the fantasy art field and they are drawing fantasy art and it's fine, right? It, it's technically at a high uh, skill level, 
but it's not right. resonating with the viewers so much. They'll click like, and then they'll keep scrolling. They won't comment, won't buy anything. But So now part of the uh, uh, marketing has to be, well, how are you connecting with the, the viewer? Not just um, is it good, but are you doing something that they're going to care about? Right. So that is the melody stuff that you're pushing into. Like they know how to uh, shred. Like they know how to uh, uh, flick the guitar, guitar string and press the right uh, bars at the right time really quickly. But mm -hmm. now how do they actually make someone actually enjoy the music they're playing rather than just playing the music really quick? Right. So yeah. I guess that's going to be something that uh, tattoo artists can come up with with their own branding for – what makes this tattoo artist stand out from all the other ones that are highly proficient at their craft? Well, and it comes down to the creative content because we just can't, we can't really push the bar as far as how clean a tattoo can look, like how well the lines and color is placed because the technology has improved so much with the machines and, and the pigment and needles that you can't really exceed what, where we're at now. I think we've reached the ceiling on that personally. So now it's like exactly what you're saying. Are you creating a tattoo that's memorable, that's unique? Everyone's doing high quality tattooing as far as technically speaking, but who's doing something unique? And I think that's sort of when magic happens because you can't just rely on, like from a guitar perspective, you used to be able to impress people if you could just play scales really fast. I mean, that, listen to any solo in the 1980s. That was impressive. But a lot of those guys have been forgotten, but the world mourned a few months ago when Eddie Van Halen died. Because Eddie Van Halen did all that, but he did it in a unique way. And what he did was virtuosic, but it was also extremely memorable. And had some, it, people have formed like emotional bonds with his music. I mean, music's different than art, you know, obviously. But as far as tattooing goes, I think, I think we're, we're on the edge of really seeing that take off. And that's when you're going to see a lot of people doing mediocre stuff just not be able to hang anymore and I, I worry about that as an old guy i'm now an old guy tattooer I, i'm not going to say it doesn't worry me i see what some of the younger tattooers are doing and it's kind of scary in some ways like i don't know if i'll be able to continue in the tattoo industry 10 years from now just because of that so it was something that i wanted to hear you expand on more it's something that we've talked briefly about you know uh prior to coming on the coming on the podcast is you know like kind of where tattooing is now and this place that i think you and i are both at where it's um it's it there's a different feel i don't want to say that like we've fallen out of love with tattooing because it will always have that place for us because you know we have had so many sacred experiences um you know in it um but you know the industry is changing you know and we have a sort of different feeling about it can you uh, talk more about that you know like how, like um you know what are the we've talked about changes that it's going through but for you personally you know what's your feeling on tattooing now and what does that mean for you in the future so i'll preface this by saying anything critical i'm gonna say is from my own personal experience and obviously it's from my own personal experience but it's it's not meant to denigrate tattooing. Imagine, I view it sort of like, I don't know, like talking to my brother about my dad. I love him, but we're maybe being critical about some things. And the point isn't to say, to shit all over tattooing. It's to, I'm going to say some things that might be construed as negative. And so the reason why I'm careful about that is if there's any other tattooers watching or if somebody I work with especially is, it watches this. Um, I don't want it to, like you said, I don't, I'll always love tattooing. But you have to understand in the tattoo industry, if you're not a zealot for tattooing, then you're almost considered a traitor in, in some circles. Like some tattooers, a lot of tattooers will view you as, like you're not really a true believer. Um, I feel like a lot of people <clears throat> tattooing is a substitute religion or like a substitute it, it's almost like this metaphysical um, this lens that they put on to view the world through tattooing I mean it, it really can be like that for some people and I understand it's sacred like that for some people because it, it really it, it get, it's given me the life I have so anyway 
I respect it. I love it. I'll always respect it. But some of the stuff I'm going to say is rooted in how I've changed my mind over the years for me, myself, personally. So that being said, yeah, I mean, I think when I reconnected with you, I think one of the things that I found refreshing or or I was kind of stoked on is that you, like when I, when I saw the stuff that you're doing with your illustration, like what you, I don't understand how you, I don't, I don't get that sort of art, that sort of, that conceptual, I'm not creative like that. So it always impresses me to see that sort of thing. Um, and I was looking through your art and it was just really cool to see that you, you evolved and the folk, your focus drifted from tattooing into something like that. Now that doesn't mean you don't tattoo or you hate it, but you've just you've evolved and kind of your 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 artistic focus shifted, and I like that because the exact same thing happened to me. Um, it happened probably seven or eight years ago when I started painting iconography. Um, I'm Russian Orthodox. A lot of people don't know what that is. I won't go into a long explanation. You can look it up on Google, but. <clears throat> I converted to Russian Orthodox Christianity about eight years ago. And a big part of Russian Orthodoxy, or Orthodoxy in general, um, is iconography. And an icon is, essentially, it's, it's art. It's sacred art that is, I'm trying to explain this in a way, so I don't have to use like theological language, but it's essentially, it's essentially a way to like when you go into an Orthodox church, there's paintings all over. We call them icons because they, an icon is, is sort of a, a representational, it's an image, it's a representation, a physical representation of a deeper spiritual reality, okay? Whether that's Christ or, or the Virgin Mary, we call her the Theotokos, or a scene from a, a saint or a scene from his life or a, you know, the resurrection, whatever. Um, as Orthodox, we don't believe that reality is, is separated. Like, like, I don't believe that reality is some, you know, the only thing that exists is material. Reality is multi-layered. There's, there's different stories um, where we're all, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that because, man, I'm going to get off on some, like, weird conversation or weird weird rabbit trail nobody's gonna know what i'm talking about so anyway i'll just say that i converted to, to russian orthodox christianity and sacred art iconography is a huge part of um, the faith and as an artist as a tattooer and an artist in general obviously i would be drawn to iconography i'll i don't know i'll just i'll grab an icon and just show you like this is an icon i painted a couple years ago of saint anne the, the the mother of the virgin mary okay and so this when you go into an orthodox church this is kind of the stuff you see painted all over the walls you know up, up by the front by the altar and it has theological significance it's not just pretty pictures that we like to see uh we have icons that stream myrrh myrrh is this fragrant oil it smells like roses this is really really um otherworldly smell and i know a lot of people are are materialists or they they're agnostic that's fine i at one time i was an atheist and that's totally cool i'm just telling you what i've seen and experienced um we have icons that stream myrrh meaning miraculously this oil comes out of them it sounds crazy believe it or not don't believe it but I, i've seen it with my own eyes it's not trickery there's no way it could have been trickery so i've seen stuff like that so that how that relates is that it's not just pretty pictures, okay? I wouldn't have gotten into this if it was just a way to beautify a worship space. There's deep significance to this, and the more, the more I got involved with my faith, the more I realized that it would, I would be doing a disservice to myself and to God if I didn't serve the church in that way. So, the reason why I explained all that is is to sort of give everyone an idea as to why my focus shifted from tattooing so dramatically, okay? It wasn't because I just found another interest. It was because it was, it was literally a spiritual thing. And so when I started to pursue painting iconography, I threw myself into it with abandon. 
And from there, um, I mean, I had a lot of help from other iconographers. And it was really interesting to see, as I figured it out and got better at it, how close tattooing was to putting an icon together and, and coming up with a concept and painting an icon. The steps are very similar. And so a lot of what I learned in tattooing directly translated into painting Orthodox iconography. From there, I did that for several years. Um, it, it got to a point where I was able to start doing it professionally. So I do, I do commissions for churches all over the world uh, and for individuals, for private collectors and for churches. I do, I do large pieces on canvas that are hung on the walls with a, a technique called maroflage. It's basically like wallpaper. It's hung on the walls. Um, and I also do large icons, whatever, small icons, whatever. But I do it in an official capacity for the Orthodox Church. From there is when I got into oil painting, because I got some commissions from some Roman Catholic churches, and they wanted something in a more Western, Baroque style. And I do, I do more realism with tattooing, so I knew I might have the skill set to get into that, but I didn't really know much about Western art in that capacity. And so when I really got into it, it was overwhelming, because if you look, if you look at that stuff, like you look at a Caravaggio painting, and you try to dissect it, it's like you don't really know where to start because it's, these paintings are just so insane. They did them like five, four or five, six hundred years ago. You look at this classical Baroque Western art, and it's just mind-boggling that someone was able to do that. And that's sort of when the bug bit me because it was like, wait, I want to back-engineer this. It became a challenge. I want to figure out how they did this. And so I threw myself into that to figure out how to, how to paint like the old masters did. And to my... To my great surprise and joy, I found out that there was an enormous amount of instructional material on the internet for this. And there are people who just specifically teach what are called master copies. That's where you, you quite literally copy a piece of art from a master painter. And then I realized, or realized, I, I learned that that's in those older ateliers, like before there was photography, for example, um, Rembrandt would send people that worked for him in his workshop to Florence and all these other areas to do master copies. They would copy these beautiful paintings there to bring, but not just to teach, not just to learn as, as his apprentices, but also to take back as reference for that workshop, for that, that atelier, I guess. Well, it wasn't an atelier then, but um, that's sort of what would become the atelier model that we have today. But anyway... Um, I sort of I dove into the master copy thing, and to this day, I still love it. I mean, this is one I've been working on a while. It's a master copy, but I didn't come up with that cool painting. It's a master copy, but um, I have learned more in the last couple of years oil painting than I've learned in my entire life as an artist, and it's because oil painting has, has forced me to face my inadequacies. Like, you can't look... You can't paint a portrait of somebody in oil, and you can kind of fudge it, but you can't, you have to face your inadequacies. And I think, I think with tattooing, you can dodge your inadequacies. You can just focus on one, a certain style and just like not really face the fact that you can't draw very well. You know, like, and there's a lot of artists that are successful doing that, and that's fine. You can you cannot be a very good illustrator and be a world class tattooer, because the content and all the stuff that you have to draw from. You can be a terrible artist, but if you can apply the tattoo with with uh, with a solid technique, like you put the tattoo into the skin and it heals well and it looks solid, well, that's just your style. Then you know you might suck at drawing, but hey, man, I, I do not to knock traditional tattooing, but a lot of guys go that route because it doesn't really require a lot of traditional illustration abilities. And so um, I will say also that realism tattooing also doesn't really require the same illustration abilities that, that you, like I can't illustrate like you guys can. I look at some of the art that Joby's done and I, I wouldn't even know where to begin with like conceptualizing. And now I know that there are, there's a foundation you can learn skills that teach you how to do that um but i don't have the creative ability i think that's where talent comes into it you're either a cr really creative person or you're not and there's two paths you can take in art you can go into 
I mean, everyone's creative, but, but I think like we were talking about earlier, if you, if you're naturally creative, um, you're going to produce good illustration art that is unique. That's interesting to look at. If you don't, if you're not naturally creative, which I'm, I'm really not, then you're going to, you're going to flourish more in, uh, and you're, you're going to blossom more, I should say, in the kind of art that I do, like that, that has almost these strict rules, like Orthodox iconography. We have a tradition. Japanese tattooing is that way. There's a, there's a, there's sort of a tradition, a box you want to keep things in, and you have some creativity within that box. But if you go outside of it, it's no longer what you're focusing on doing. So, I excelled at Orthodox iconography because of that, and um, Japanese tattoo. I do some of that, and I, I can do it. I can do some decent Japanese tattoos because of that. Because there's, there's these this box that you keep things in. Tattooing, almost any style of tattooing is that way. You can only go so far with a tattoo before it just doesn't work on the human body, right? Uh, when I look at the kind of stuff you guys do, like you were saying earlier, you get to a certain point where you can draw really well and you can render, I should say. You can render things well and it's at a professional level, but if you're not doing anything in a unique or creative way, then you're not going to succeed in that industry. You're not going to be in demand. You're not going to make any money. And not only that, uh, you're not going to be producing anything interesting to look at. So, I mean, when I, when I, when I got a, a panoramic view of the contemporary art world, I realized that it's just so much more competitive. And competitive is the wrong word. You really need to be something special to make a mark in the contemporary art world. And I just turned 40 and barring a miracle, like I don't have the time. I have five kids. I don't really have the time to and energy to do the things I need to do marketing wise to create a buzz about that. And to be honest, I don't have a body of work to do that. So that to me was a huge, that was a huge, for lack of a better term, come to Jesus moment about Maybe that delusion that I had, oh, well, you know, I've been successful with iconography. Well, I'm, I'm going to get into contemporary art. And then I see what the standard is. And I'm like, okay, so I turn around and go right back out that door. Cause, um, <clears throat> but now coming back to it, not with those goggles on, I can appreciate it more. And I can just do it because I enjoy it. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> I don't know. Going, uh, so you had mentioned more on the spiritual side. And I'm going to bring us back right. down to the superficial uh, era, area. Um, I forgot to say this before the stream, but uh, when we talk about financial stuff, be as specific or as broad as you're comfortable with. So you don't have to say exact dollars. You can just say you're comfortable with whatever. Um, yeah. How does uh, the iconography and uh, painting for re religious institutions compare to uh, tattooing financially? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it's definitely not the same right now because. It can't, I mean, it, it could be in some aspects. I'll never make the same, I'll never make, I'll, how do I put this? I won't make a living like what I have now. I've built a clientele tattoo. Okay, I have a very solid clientele where I live that will last me probably the duration of my career. So can I make more money tattooing easier? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I've already established myself doing that. Um, with what I do with iconography, I do make a portion of my income with that, but it's because, but I've sacrificed. I don't make as much. I've taken time off tattooing. I only tattoo a certain number of days. And so I think I told Joby this, I'm in a kind of a, one of those weird places where when you transition into a different career where you're, you're successful enough, where there's a light at the end of the tunnel where you feel like, okay, I should pursue this. But because it's such a non-traditional industry, I hate even using the term industry, but I mean, that's the only way you can describe it. It's such a non-traditional path as far as an income goes that I can't, I can't make decisions in the same way that, let's say, I'm like, well, I'm going to quit tattooing and go be an accountant. Like, yeah, I could do that. Okay. There's a certain way you do that. But with what I do with iconography or just being an artist in general, 
I think this can apply to being an illustrator. You know, do it because I, it's essentially the same model. I, I do work on commission. So it depends on what it is and how much work and blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, anyone that is an illustrator or a self employed artist, it's, it's whether I'm doing it for God or what, you know, whatever you want to say, or you're doing it for Wizards of the Coast. I mean, it's the same exact model, it's just in a different context. So um, I'm just at that weird, weird point where. I'm not going to quit tattooing, and I don't want to quit tattooing, but I'm trying to test the waters to figure out what a reasonable amount to draw back on tattooing is to pour into this other venture, and to where my tattooing doesn't suffer, that's also something that I worry about or, or I'm concerned about. But at the same time, financially, I can't just walk away from tattooing and just paint iconography, partly because I'm married. I have other responsibilities. I have a family I have to worry about, not just me and my harebrained dreams, you know. Um, I have to worry about my wife. My family has a standard of living that they've been used to pretty much my entire career, at least since we've been in Spokane. So I can't just selfishly say, well, daddy wants to do something else, and so you guys have to eat canned beans now every day. Like, as much as I like pork and beans, like I don't want to make my kids do that. If it was just me, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I would have already left and moved to a monastery in Russia or on Mount Athos in Greece. I'm serious. I would have, I, I totally would have done that a few years ago. I would have just said peace and gone and become a monk. But that's not the life that I have and that's not what I'm doing. So I have to be a little more cautious about how I pursue this from a business perspective. Um, and I meant that, like I said, I'm in that weird limbo spot where I'm starting to take risks with it. The beautiful thing about tattooing that I, that I love the most, one of the things I love the most is that there's an old adage that in the tattoo industry that goes, if you're good to tattooing, tattooing will be good to you. And that's, that's for the tattooer. There's another adage for the client, you get the tattoo you deserve. <laughs> and I've heard that from multiple people. You get the tattoo you deserve, and if you're good to tattooing, tattooing will be really good to you. And Regardless of the mistakes I've made and people I wish I would have treated differently, people I've worked for that I wish I would have treated differently, um, regrets that I have, I, I will say that I've done my best to be good to tattooing, to do a good job tattooing and to not disgrace it or you know, become a spectacle. I've done my best to do that, and I feel like now I've established myself, and so I can sort of cautiously move into a different area artistically and if the heat gets too hot i can i can pull back and you know uh, go work another day this week and make some money because i built a clientele which i'm extremely grateful for so yeah i mean i'm not gonna lie it's it's very hand to mouth in the industry that i'm in painting for churches and stuff but it takes a good amount of time to get notoriety doing it there's not a lot of people in the states that paint iconography at a professional level most of the people that that come over here to do the big churches and stuff like that are from russia or greece um and they have things set up in a more professional capacity in america because the orthodox church isn't huge um it's you know it's it's not it's not like there's a huge pool of people there's not a lot of competition um but again, I don't really view it in that aspect because if you approach it from a purely business aspect, you're kind of missing the point. And I'll be honest, I've, I've been very blessed. Work has sort of found its way to me and come to me, and I haven't really had to pursue it. And personally, I view that providentially, um, you know, so, so, but at the same time, you can't just view it like that. You have to have a business, uh, view the business aspect of it. And <clears throat> I'll be honest, that's been one of the biggest challenges. As a tattooer, you're self-employed, but you sort of, when you work at a shop, you sort of have a, you're self-employed, but you still, you have the name of the shop, you have a, a collective place that's sort of taken care of that you can come to, that you, you pay for, you pay a percentage or a booth rental, <clears throat> you have that to fall back on. But when you're completely self-sufficient as an artist, when you just have your, your own name, your own workshop, whatever, your, your own social media marketing, whatever it entails, that's all on you. 
you can't just re you can't rely on the sh the name of the shop or the work that these other people have done to get you business. Like for example, when I started working at Artcore all those years ago with Joby, first off, I don't know why Adam hired me. I had no business working there. I was not a very good tattooer. I think just because I true. <laughs> well, I don't know. I I don't think I really had any business working there. But Adam was me and him got along, and he was so cool to to give me a job. But um, I I got work because of those guys. Not because, I mean, nobody knew who I was in Seattle. Nobody, I'd never tattooed there. But I was able to put food in my mouth based upon the good work that Joby and Adam and Chris and all the other, Christy, I think, worked there at the time, based on the solid reputation that they built, not just in the tattoo community, but in, with their clients. And I was able to benefit from that, you know, I guess symbiotically at the time. Well, if you're out, if you're freelance on your own completely, as an artist, all you have is you. And so, I mean, that should be common sense, but coming from an industry where you could, you didn't really have to go through the pains of, of worrying and not eating, you know, unless you were in like a really slow shop or unless you were on your own and just building your own shop. If you were working at a shop and you were new, you could get work and you could get, you know, get money. But yeah, I mean, being a freelance artist in any capacity, in any field is not easy. And it requires, it requires a skill set that unfortunately, I think a lot of, a lot of artists don't inherently have. Um, I don't know if, if you guys believe, I don't know if even I believe in the whole right brain, left brain thing. I don't know if I really believe that. But I do believe that people have a natural predisposition towards whether or not they're organized or have their shit together. And as someone who is so focused on painting and art, I oftentimes neglect, you know, shipping something when I probably should have. And it, was, it wasn't because I'm, I don't care. It's because I literally forgot. I got involved in this, pro this next project and I'm like, Oh man, I was supposed to ship that. I'll do it tomorrow. And you know, the, I think a lot of artists are procrastinators in some ways. And a lot of those personality defects come out and you have to attack them and master them when you're fully a freelance artist, I think. So, yeah, it's unnerving to not have a safety net of any kind underneath. Good you. Way to put it, yeah. yeah. Um, right. And well, a cool thing about what me and you have, though, that I'm grateful to tattooing is we kind of do have a safety net with tattooing. Whereas yeah, someone, yeah. someone who's just an illustrator, for example, just getting started out as an illustrator, trying to get work, trying to get freelance work, um, they don't have, I mean, maybe they have a day job, but there comes a point where you have to, you have to balls to the wall and you have to just let go of that day job and embrace whatever it is to come. And so I feel blessed that I have tattooing as my background because it's really popular still and... I mean, I could, I could make money whenever I want because I'm not. That's not. I'm not bragging. I hope that doesn't sound. I hope that doesn't sound like arrogant. That's not what I mean at all. I, I'm just thankful that I have something like that to fall back on right now or at, at any time. You know, especially when I decide to really like. Eventually, I'm going to probably take another day off work to focus on this other thing that I'm doing, you know, this art thing. But if if I can't deal with it then I can just go back to working that day. And I, I will have to say, I give a shout out to the guy who, uh, I work at a shop called, a tattoo studio called Anchored Art Tattoo in Spokane. And the guy that owns the place I work at, you know, the reason I've worked there for almost eight years, it, it's not a coincidence. I've worked in a lot of places. And I will say that the reason I work at Anchored Art is because they, they don't give me any reason to go work on my own. Like it's the only the only people I've ever worked for who I who I feel like understand that that they understand that the people that they have working for them are an asset, you know, and they yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna brown nose Jeremy, the owner, but um, I'm just very thankful that I have that and that I have someone who's supportive of this other thing I'm doing and isn't like, well, that's taking money out of my pocket, bro, and you got to do, you know, because that's really common in the tab industry. I've worked at places like that where it's like. If you're not, if you're not here. I'm not making money, so you need to find another place. You know, that's just that's common, or at least it was. So, I'm extremely lucky to have someone who's supportive of this other thing I'm doing, 
who understands how important it is to me and why it's important um, and who is respectful of that and allows me to do whatever I want, basically, as far as that goes. So. You mentioned uh, not really having had to do a lot of active pursuit in finding clients or a lot has come your way, but surely you've done some. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, to the degree that you have actively sought out people that want to, you know, purchase the iconography from you, um, what channels have you used to find those people or by what channels have they found you? Uh, mostly it's mostly been social media. Facebook has been a big one. I never really spent much time on Facebook until several years ago when I started painting iconography. Um, and part of the reason is because I think out of all the social media platforms, well, Facebook tends to have an older audience or an older user base. And a lot of Orthodox clergy are older. And a lot of clergy and Orthodox people from around the world in Greece and Russia, they tend to use Facebook a lot. They don't use TikTok or any of those other social media platforms. They use Facebook. So I've used Facebook a lot and just had a presence there. Another, another blessing I've had is um, I'm very close with... Um, he's an abbot. He's it's kind of the, lead, the head of this Russian monastery, Russian Orthodox monastery over in Seattle on Vashon Island. Um, and his name is Abbot Trifon. And... He's, he's super well-known in the Orthodox world, has like a podcast and goes and speaks all over the world and stuff. He's a very well-known guy. And he's my, he's real close to me. He's my confessor. He's someone that's, the best way to describe it is a sort of like my spiritual mentor. Someone I talk to on a daily basis who I spend a lot of time with. He's really well-known and I've done a lot of iconography for their church, for their temple. Um, and he's helped promote me. So I got my name out that way too. But mostly, it's been mo mostly been social media, and then via the social media, then turns into word of mouth. Um, I do I I, spend, I do a lot more on Instagram now, just because. I mean, I think I think I really do think Facebook's dying. It has been for a while, um, and I, I'm also on a, a site called VK, which is kind of like Russian Facebook. It's essentially a clone of Facebook, but it's just it's super popular in Russia. Um, I don't do too much on DK, but it's mostly been social media, so that's, that's probably been the, the, the biggest effort as far as marketing goes. I, I have a couple domain names I've purchased, but the reason I haven't built a website and I need to do this is because, like what I said earlier, those logistical things I just somehow never find time to do. And even my wife says, like, if you want to take this to the next step, um, <clears throat> I'll talk about that for a minute, about branding now. Whereas years ago, you could be a freelance artist and make a good living and not have to be, have a brand and not have to promote yourself that way. But nowadays, because of the competition and not just the competition, but the, the amount of information and how quickly people ignore things, see it and scroll by, you have to consistently build a brand. And I hate that. I, I despise that. But it's sort of part, it's one of the rules of the game now. You have to do it or else you're you're not going to be able to reap the benefits of being a freelance artist. You have to play that game. And so to what degree you do that or how you do it, I mean, that's variable depending on, upon what, what field you're in, what you're doing. But I have to do the website thing. I have to get off my ass and finish doing the website thing. <clears throat> and I think that way that'll kind of open up some more avenues because there are definitely people that don't, do the social media thing, but I have been very blessed and, and very successful via Facebook and Instagram. Um, those have been primarily the avenues I've used. And it, it started out, honestly, I didn't have the intention of moving away from tattooing. And I just started painting icons and people wanted to buy them. And so I sold a few and then people were commissioning them and it kind of snowballed from there. And the better I got at it and the more interested I got in it, and the more I tried to conform what I was doing to what is the professional standard, you know, the better I got at painting icons. And obviously, if you're putting out something that is higher quality, more people are going to be interested in it, right? So that's kind of how that developed. And then 
it, it built momentum that way. But I, I, I still rely heavily on Facebook, mostly Facebook and Instagram. So with Facebook, are you using just your own main feed or are you using groups? Yeah, I use, I mean, a little bit of both. I use, I just have a personal page. I found that I had a, like a business page, but it's kind of, iconography is kind of like a niche industry. I hate to say it that way, but it is. And so I, I didn't find that I would get a lot of benefit out of spending a bunch of money on a business page. It's, it, I, well, personally, I saw the amount of money that Anchored Art, the place I work tattoo at, I saw what um, the lady that does all that, Jeremy's wife, <clears throat> she's really hardcore about that on Instagram and Facebook. And I've seen the amount of money they pay. Now, it's beneficial for them, but for with what I do, it's just not worth it. So I don't even have a business page. I do participate in some iconography-specific groups, but honestly, it's, it's, I've, I've had the best success making, having personal interactions with people. People want to see that. Um, I've even considered like kind of what, doing what you're doing with a, a Twitch stream. You anticipated it, my next comment. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm going to do that. I have another friend of mine. He's Orthodox. His name's Reagan Lodge. He does comics and stuff. He's an illustrator. No Reagan. You know, yeah. you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, he's a, he's a friend of mine. He's Orthodox. He's super cool, really nice guy, uh, and does really unique. His, his comic is, I sometimes don't even think he knows how cool his own comic is. It's super I don't, I really don't. I don't like how unique it is, but it has like this weird nostalgia. There's something, you know, I don't know what it is, but I honestly, I don't even think he really gets it sometimes. But um, there's another, another artist that, um, you know, that I follow. There's a lot of artists that do the Twitch thing, but so I've explored some of that stuff and doing a lot of people have asked me to teach. There's a, there's a huge need for people to learn iconography especially americans so we don't we can kind of build our own culture of that as orthodox in america and not pull from greece and serbia and russia as much so i kind of feel called to do that to teach others how to paint icons i think that's really important to pass this stuff on <clears throat> and I've, I, I've considered doing like online zoom workshops and stuff like that but again i'm in that weird limbo where it's like i don't have time to learn to do that because i'm still tattooing so much and that eats a chunk of my availability that i could put into this so it, it's going to take some time but <clears throat> i don't know definitely the twitch thing i never thought of that until i, I started talking to you about it and i, I looked on yours and saw what, what you're doing and i'm like oh man that would well, be really a, interesting to do there's a couple more bugs <laughs> that i'd like to put in your bed and and see how they uh how they work out um, and forgive me for providing unsolicited advice. You, a lot, right. Some of this you may have already considered and, and set aside for various reasons. But one thing that I was thinking of you know, while you were talking, you know, and uh, especially in this uh, need to build a website, um, your wife having been in that space of uh, professional blogging already is uh, highly suited to increase traffic to your website the the hypothetical future website that i hope that you will have very soon um in terms of you know like her understanding of seo search engine optimization and all of those kinds of things um having had to be familiar with that when she was blogging um could probably be a great resource in developing some of that kind of material for your website that will right. generate that will generate traffic for you. I've just started skimming the surface of that myself. Yeah. I started I started a blog for this reason, um, you know, and I've already seen results from it. Uh, it's it's nothing huge. It's nothing like life changing uh, yet, but I can see the potential. I can see the promise, and I and I know personally people that have implemented certain things you know that are definitely like making a significant difference for them and i know you mentioned before you know your wife set it aside because it's this sort of it can become this really like gross plasticized fake monster i would i would offer this though in situations maybe hopefully like mine hopefully like yours where you're presenting a real person and something that is like very important and sacred to you and you express that as part of the 
forgive me for saying it, the brand. <laughs> right. There's I no think other way that, to say it. Yeah, I think that people will resonate with that and you can maybe avoid that feeling of like, oh my God, I'm just creating this like bizarre, like fake product, you know, and then like right. pretending that that's who I am or, or, or whatever, you know, and right. it's, it's something that we talk about or have talked about a lot, uh, you know, on the podcast, this idea of marketing as a dirty word. Um, yeah. and we've kind of worked or tried to work to uh, alleviate some of that, um, stain from it. Um, and, and, and in my experience talking to, you know, a lot of people in marketing and, you know, who are trying to do that work themselves, I've come to this understanding with marketing that it, it doesn't have to be this gross, slick snake oil salesman thing. It, it's just you, uh, uh, a guest that we had on, uh, it was, uh, Moose's friend, Brian, uh, uh he, he's the, um, I'm going to fuck it up. Moose D and D. Say it again. The director of marketing for D&D. The director of marketing for D&D. And we had this conversation with him, and he put it in this really interesting way that stuck with me. Um, Imagine that you're building a house, and you're really proud of the house that you're building, and you're going to people and saying, hey, look at this awesome thing that I made. And from that standpoint, it's just you and your excitement and your pride for the thing that you're making. And not false pride, not like fake, weird egotism pride, but just like... I'm excited about this thing that I did. And then other people get excited about it. There's an, for better or worse, that's still marketing, but it's marketing right. without this, like, Oh man, fucking work. I don't even know like what the imitation would be, but you know what I'm talking <laughs> about? You know, like the thing that turns people off, the thing that makes people think gross thoughts about marketing. Right. So there's, so there's that, that, uh, I know you're, uh, you're 100%, you're 100% right. And for me, it's been, it's taken me a while to work through. So there's a, I have a, I have another acquaintance. I I won't say we're like friends, but he's an acquaintance and he has a very big YouTube channel. Um, he's a, he's an icon carver. Um, his name's Jonathan Pajot. He does like, yeah, I mean, he's, he like hobnobs with like Jordan Peterson and he does like, his whole thing is, is symbolism and he does symbolism and iconography, and he's he's been uh, definitely an acquaintance, someone I, I can ask questions to and talk to. And I approached him about, I asked him some questions about how do you do this in the context of it being not just some commercial thing, but what he does and what what I am trying to do is something similar, where it's I don't want to be a representative for Orthodox Christianity. But it's interesting. I was actually at a monastery. I was at over in Vashon, Vashon Island at the monastery last week. And I kind of have social anxiety a little bit with people I don't know. And I think everybody does to a degree, especially nowadays. But I get really weird socially and and sometimes can come off like, I don't know, kind of a jerk. I don't mean to be, but I just am socially retarded sometimes. But anyway, um, I was sitting there eating and... I get really uncomfortable when people are when when they praise me or something I, I've done, and I just get really weird. And there was a lady that was there that started talking about me being an iconographer, and and oftentimes in the Orthodox world that can be something that people admire or they want to they want a connection to, they want to talk to you, you know. And that um, I've kind of shunned that in some ways, probably because I don't feel like I'm adequately prepared to take on that or to to instruct people in that way or to be that person. And the girl, this girl that was there visiting, I was talking to her about iconography and I was kind of telling her the same thing, like, well, I don't really, not really a person that, I don't really like to be called an iconographer. I don't really like the attention. She said something that was kind of, it was blunt and it was kind of like, it was interesting because it, it, at first I was kind of like, what the hell are you talking about? But then as it sat in my mind, I was like, maybe she's right. She said, why don't you just, em- why don't you just embrace that and let it be what it is instead of, instead of worrying about if it looks this way or doesn't look this way or if you're perceived, who cares? Just, you are that thing, so just be what it is and let the chips fall where they may. And I think that what you were saying about marketing and all that other stuff, that, that, 
And that sort of ties into the fact that I'm very, I'm almost a little too self-aware when it comes to uh, almost paranoid that I'm going to come off as, as a, like a fake. I don't know. I don't know if, if that makes sense. Like, like yeah. it, it's not because I'm not, it's not because I, I think that what I'm producing artistically isn't at a certain level. That's not it at all. It's just, it's the added thing to where attached to the art that I'm producing is also a spirituality or, or a religious community. It fixes value to this. So it's not just a dragon or something like that that's important to that specific thing, but doesn't really carry with it the same weight, I guess, spiritually. I don't know if that makes sense. I think that's where some of that comes from, and I'm just real weary to embrace that. But in order to break out of dabbling and doing it as a hobby, I think that's something that comes, comes with the territory. And like my, my friend Jonathan gave me a lot of good advice on that and, and how to guard yourself from some of those things. But from a, from a, down from like a, a pragmatic perspective, marketing in and of itself is it might as well be Chinese. Like, I don't understand it. I, I understand the basic principles of it, but it seems like a daunting thing as an artist to get your feet under. I know it's simple, but to, I guess to get the ball rolling, because I feel like it's once the ball is rolling, you understand what you need to do to maintain it, and it's almost like you're on a schedule. You have to do certain things a certain way. I remember watching my wife and how she did her, she had like a schedule. I have to do this and post this at this time and do that. But as someone who, who doesn't really think that way, I think the intimidating part is, is learning. It's learning that stuff. And there's like this cacophony on the internet of, of the right thing to do. And it's so hard to dig through all of the various courses and free advice and people's running their mouths saying that this is the way to do it. And especially in the art world, I mean, you've got, you guys have seen the, the ads that pop up market your art become this but it's just so easy you know so it becomes this like i said this cacophony of noise that oftentimes it's just easier to plug your ears and go back with your paintbrush or your your pencil or whatever and just focus on what you're good at so to make matters worse the uh thing you're supposed to be doing changes from month to month year to year like the what you're supposed to do on instagram five years ago yeah is different what you're supposed to do on instagram today Report, Even like two today, years ago. Today, for example, my wife, I was looking at something on Instagram and I was like, man, I should do something like that. It was like a, a reels thing. My wife was like, oh yeah, that, she said, that's what people are doing. That's what they want to see is reels. And then I was like, I don't know how to do that. Like I tried and I couldn't figure it out. So I was just like, ah, and I just abandoned it, you know? Recently, there was a, a blog post by somebody who was reached out to by Instagram by somebody that actually runs their accounts there and told them what they had to do in order to get the algorithm to start supporting them. And it was like listing out how many times they had to go live, how many times they had to do reels, how many times they, they do post stories, how many times they had post posts. And it was more than that person was willing to do. So they just said, all right, I'm just going to do some of that, but I can't do all of that. And that's just going to have to be good enough, even though it's not going to be quite exactly uh what's good enough uh, if you want to look that up i think it was called like why your engagement on instagram sucks recently something like that and it, you'll see a picture of a cartoon frog that's worrying is the do you, do you feel like they purposefully change it and, and like it's a game or something oh like, absolutely so yeah yes. it, just, it, it pissed me off kind of and i got to the point where i just kind of gave up yeah there's a few things that are go into it one um they don't want anybody to know what the algorithm is because once people start knowing what the algorithm is it stops functioning because instead of people acting like they're supposed to do, they start acting like robots. And right. the machine is not built to sort out robots. It's built to sort out humans. So they have to change it up. Uh -huh. I think there's also an element of, you know, just them needing you to always be engaged. And it's like, if you, if you can figure out what the what the algorithm is doing there's a certain um, efficiency that comes with that and there's a certain things you can do to streamline your efforts make it really quick for you and you can spend less time on the platform they fucking 
hate that. The last thing that they want is you spending less time on the platform. And to right. that art, to that article that Moose was talking about, it, it, it's more than what most people are going to be able to, uh, accomplish just, just physically and mentally, like you'd be fucking exhausted doing it, or you would have a team of people that were helping you do it it's with you. Yeah, it's a day job in itself, you know, so and it's just it's so weird that they, they want you to do, to do that much work for them. It's well, like, I think the uh, the issue I, is that they keep adding new stuff as time goes by. When it first started out, it was just posting on Instagram. And that's how the algorithm was working. And then they allowed you to have videos in your feed. So then you could post a video instead of just posting a, an image. So they prioritized that. And then they started coming out with stories and then reels and then live. So they want you to do all of these things in order to be considered an actual user that they want to promote. So yeah, I have, my engagement on my, my tattoo account, I got up to, I think I have like 10 or 11,000 followers on my tattoo account. And then I hit a brick wall. And it just, I have, I still get followed, but you know, there's like a, you, you bleed followers and you get followers and all it. And I think my levels are like, I have just enough water going out of the pot with just enough rainfall coming in so the levels stay about the same and honestly I, I gave up on it in that capacity i gave up on it as a as a promotional capacity outside of my local area for, for tattooing because i'm not really i get clients from seattle and a lot from canada from the surrounding area but i don't i don't have people i'm not imp i'm not some important big shot that gets people flying here from all over the world and like i, I don't get that at all so I don't really care too much. I use it now. I, I just stopped posting on it all the time. I used to post every day and post this. And I tried to play the game, but I just said, screw it, because it just got annoying. And I hated the fact that I was on it so much. Like during, during Lent, Lent is a period of time before Easter. And it's about, well, it's a little longer than, it's, I guess it's about... I think I, I think it was about two months I was off. Yeah, I was off, I think, the duration of Lent. Around there. Anyway, I took two months off this year. Uh, between when Lent started and, and pa we call it Pascha, or Easter. And so I had about two months where I wasn't on social media at all, on Facebook or Instagram. <clears throat> and when I came back to my Instagram, my engagement, even now, two or three months later, is zero. Like... I don't get I don't get new people seeing my stuff. It doesn't really pop up with the hashtags. I'm I'm dead to I'm dead to them basically, and I'm like eh. So I just stopped posting. I mean I have my clients I communicate with on there. <clears throat> my uh, my iconography Instagram, I use that more, but still like, I wasn't on there, and so I went from getting I think I have like twenty five twenty six hundred followers on my tattoo Instagram, and I used to get three four hundred likes and engagements or whatever and when i stop posting as much i'm down to like maybe a hundred you know 120 people just don't see my stuff anymore and so i always wondered if if at that point like do you just start over and do everything right or do you try to do you know build up momentum again it's so i've heard so many different things from so many different people so this is another thing that sort of opened my eyes about SEO, you know, and, and, and thinking more about website traffic, you know, like traffic to something that I own rather than trying to do all of this work for something that somebody else owns, who's they're reaping all of the benefits. You're not all of this work that you're doing. And ultimately, what do you end up really getting for it? Maybe you make some sales, but I, I, I I've yet to be convinced if you don't have 100k plus it's maybe not doing a whole lot for you um but anyway the the thing that started changing my mind or making me you know really interested in seo website traffic it's it's stuff that i own it's my content um and it's and there's a way to get people to come to that you know by like all of the things that you do to get google to notice you now once google is noticing you that's a whole that's the whole world that it, you, you know, you're not thinking about like hashtags and con consistent. I mean, you're making consistent contributions to it, but it's not nearly the type of grind. that's something that, you know, like Instagram. And if you do, if you work it out correctly, it's evergreen. 
you can take a month off and you don't have to you're not worried about like the slip in engagement because you're you're appealing to the search engine things that people right. are looking for and they're going to continue they're going to keep looking for that you know what i mean and as and if you're right. positioned in order to be one of the things that they find when they're looking for it that's going to continue to be the case regardless of you know like if you want to take a, a month off or or whatever so similarly with a with we surprise people by suggesting pinterest because that seems like an antiquated uh social media platform but it also tends to be the most evergreen of the social media platforms you could post something today and then six years from now you'll still be getting hits on it so if you refer that back to your website you'll forever be getting uh links from the social media platform pinterest to your website and then you on your website you can be supporting whatever it is you're doing whether it's uh a Patreon or uh, something for Kickstarter or just individual commissions, whatever it is that your, uh, uh, your brand is uh, pu pulling off and uh, whatever material you're producing for people. As an, as, from, an, from a perspective of a, an artist, there's all these website builders like Wix and all these different companies. In your guys' opinion, would you, do you think it's better in the in the art industry to build your own website on something like that or like wordpress or something like that or have someone else do because i've had a few people approach me about oh i'll build your website and it's either oh you gotta you know they wanted a bunch of icons or something and it's fine but like i generally don't like to do trade work for that reason because somebody always feels like they got you know and so um i've looked into that that's been part of the challenge is trying to get a website built and i'm just not sure whether or not i should pay to have one built or totally have my own control over it so squarespace is incredibly common yep yep that's what i was just going to say I, for okay. someone in your position i would strongly I, i'm not an expert i mean i don't my record take my recommendation for what, what it is um but uh i've had great experience with squarespace uh it's incredibly robust in terms of uh what it's able to do and how easy it is to use it it's relatively intuitive there can be some little subtle things that are not immediately apparent and some things that they do that are like why did they do it that way but for the most part um very intuitive very easy to get familiar with um and it's a lot of drag and drop kind of stuff whereas like with a wordpress kind of thing um there's there's a lot of building up that you have to do to get it to a certain point and you also end up with uh a lot of plugins that you have to buy and sometimes they don't work well together and then if the person isn't maintaining the plugin it can die off you have to figure out something and god forbid you've really become reliant on this particular plugin now it doesn't work anymore squarespace is all like pretty reliable and predictable in terms of what it's going to be so short of like having like a high end uh, you know, web builder, which is going to be really fucking expensive. Um, Squarespace is a, a pretty good way to go. Uh, and all, and you'll be, you'll be able to, you know, start a store, a okay. blog, all of the things that you're going to want to do pretty straightforward and, and, and how to do it. Yeah. Interesting. I'll have to do that then. Cause that's when the biggest hurdle is, is again, just lack of knowledge and not really, not really knowing what direction to go with it because you, you get so many different, so much different input. I'll do this or you should do that or whatever. Now with Squarespace, this, you were talking about search engine optimization. Is that, is that something you personally do or do you pay to have that done? It's something that I personally do. It's, uh, it's, it's weird. <laughs> it's like, it's hard to start figuring out all of the things that you need to do, but then you start getting a sense of what it is and it becomes a, a, a little bit more self-evident um for a long time i've just like totally fucking lost like i understand the words i understand what it's supposed to do but where do i even start it's like after the show i'll hit you up with like some resources and things that maybe you could start playing you, with yeah to to, to you have, figure you have out. noticed that that's helped yeah, the blog in particular, um, some things that I've done with Pinterest uh, and things that I've done with um, like 
meta tags and descriptions that I've put on images in my store or in my illustration gallery that Google is able to like crawl through and recognize um, ends up, you know, becoming traffic. Uh, the, the blog in particular, though, uh, has done a lot to start drawing in traffic. And the, the long term plan is, you know, to generate traffic via all of this optimization and then offer things like um, and, and this is a, was another thing that I was going to suggest to you because you mentioned teaching. Um, right. And I think that there could be a really good access point for you to have like uh, like a Skillshare class or like do like mm -hmm. gum roads. Like you were talking about the iconography painting having kind of like this specific set, this sort of standardized process and style to it. You yeah. could teach that. You could have a recorded uh, workshop that teaches that. And put that on Skillshare or on Gumroad and your website. And that would be passive income that would be a constant, continuous, evergreen thing that, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about, like, constantly promoting and marketing on Instagram. And then if you right. work those two things together, you know, the, the SEO and the blog and the Pinterest and blah, 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 all the stuff that you do with your website and then have that as like a thing, I don't, it, that's that's where that marketing engine starts rolling. And like I said, we'll talk more about it after the, after the show, but I think it's also sure. useful information to talk about here because no, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's hopefully something that more people. I think it's, it's, it's totally an aspect that most artists overlook until you're forced, until you're forced to do it, until you're forced to do it to the point where you're not going to eat unless you jump over that hurdle. And I think, I think that that hurdle specifically is, do you want to do this professionally? No matter what genre of art you're doing, if you want to, to truly be a freelance artist, nowadays you just you can't outsource this stuff. You have to be the one to do that if you want to be in control of not just what you're producing, but who you're dealing with and where this income is coming from. To be truly free, I mean, it sounds corny, but you know, it's, it's really good to have that knowledge. So. And I mean, admittedly, that's something that I've, I've just kind of not really worried about too much because I've coasted along and done okay with social media, but I am at that point, I'm in that limbo period where in order to break into this more professionally long-term, um, from a logistics standpoint, everything we just talked about is a necessity. So I'm glad we, you brought it up. Yeah. And the... The thing that I would sh say to hopefully be like reassuring is that um, it, there's a learning curve to it that can seem daunting, but once you get up to that, and it's within reason, it's not fucking rock and science. It's you can, and again, yeah. you know, you're in a lucky position. You have your wife that probably has a lot of this knowledge already. Uh, once you get up to that point, there's sort of a, a set it and forget it aspect to it, you know, where it's like you got that done, and it's like semi passive. Like there's still things that you want to do to keep maintaining it, keep encouraging traffic, but it's way, way, way less uh, of, it feels like less of a, a burden than like Instagram, you know, or any of the other right. uh, social media outlets it kind of blew my mind. I, I was like when it, and again, it, this, uh, a previous guest, uh, Christopher Kant, um, you know, we interviewed him about his blog and I thought that blogging was dead, you know, like, I like what? Like, I know that I know that blogs still exist, but who fucking knew that this is something that could still be beneficial, especially for, for artists. But, uh, but anyway, um, uh, I definitely don't want to cut you off, but, uh, I think we are coming into uh, a wrap up, but I wanted to ask if we had covered anything that you wanted to say more about. Is there anything that we missed that you wanted to, uh, highlight or. Not really. I think we, we had a pretty broad, good conversation. I, I rambled a little bit there, but I don't think that's avoidable when you're, you know, trying to talk about so many, such a broad, broad, various topics or whatever. Um, yeah, it was an enjoyable nice. conversation. The rambling is awesome, man. I love the rambling. Um, <laughs> we bring you on to ramble. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I met rambling expectations. Uh, just a couple more questions to tie mm -hmm. it up. Um, where would you like uh, people to find out uh, more about you and your work? Uh, pretty, 
pretty simple. I mean, like I said earlier, I mostly just do Facebook and Instagram right now. I mean, now I'll have a, I have a website URL, but it's, I don't have anything up yet. So hopefully in the next few weeks or months, you'll be able to just search my name, Shane Swenson dot com and i'll have that that's probably what i'll use for my iconography um and my art my other art as well um yeah. but continue uh, uh now if you want to look at anything i'm i'm on instagram as instagram.com forward slash shane swenson it's s-h-a-y-n-e i have a y in my name it's interesting that the only shanes i've met that had y's in their name it's usually s-h-a-n-e the only other Shanes I've met that had a Y have both been strippers, which is really bizarre. It's like a weird, like a stripper version. I don't know what my mom was thinking, but I definitely am not. You don't, yeah, you don't want to see me strip. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, are you sure this isn't, you know, yeah, uh, a, a sign? No. <laughs> uh, no, I guess that's the only thing we get. We could talk about uh, making your OnlyFans account. My OnlyFans. Oh man, yeah, I'm sure everyone would just. Run this. It's probably, I probably wouldn't get the audience I was uh, thinking with something like that. So, well, you can advertise yourself as the Christian dad bod. Yeah, Christian dad bod on OnlyFans. I mean, I'm sure. I don't know. I've never been on OnlyFans. I'm serious. Never been on there. <laughs> but I'm sure there's someone on there that has. Apparently, with OnlyFans, it's not just like sexual content. Someone told me it's it's like everything. It's a bunch of different stuff. Pretty much anybody that has been banned from Patreon now has an OnlyFans. Ah, uh, I see. Okay, so it's it's a Patreon alternative, as opposed yeah, to, basically, sort of. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Except you can do nudie pictures. Anyway, that was a little bit of a weird uh, departure, but yeah, just uh, on Facebook, it's just Shane Swenson icons, and um, Instagram is uh, Instagram dot com forward slash Shane Swenson, and then that's my tattooing, and then Shane Swenson icons is is my art and iconography. So we'll have those it. in the show notes uh, after the show. It's cool. People that, uh, want to cl- click the links, um, cool, cool. R- real quick. I just want to throw in there. Uh, whenever we might talk about um, uh, imposter syndrome, Sam Gushu had a good, a great quote, which is, uh, "Don't compare your behind the scenes to other people's highlights." So, whenever somebody uh, brings that up, I think that's the something that people should keep in mind. That's true. That's a really good quote. Who said that? Uh, Sam Gushu. She's a concept artist and illustrator. Okay. Don't remember that. Well, our our trademark final question, Shane. Aside from work and personal projects, what's one thing in the world that's happening that you're excited about? This is going to be kind of counterintuitive, but I think the more the more difficulties that we experience in society, I think the facade of never-ending progress and the facade of consumer comfort that we've all grown up with is going to rapidly diminish and when that happens pain comes right it sucks pain comes from that but at the same time it produces authenticity and i think adversity just like when you lift weights which i obviously don't but just like when you lift weights your muscle fibers you experience pain and tearing your muscle fibers but what happens they grow and they become stronger um I think culturally, socially, just the world in general is on the precipice of some very difficult times, no matter where you fall on the spectrum, politically or ideologically. We're all in for some tough times, and um, what's going to come of that is more authenticity and abandonment of consumerism in a lot of ways, um, and sort of a reconnection with things that are perennially important. Uh, in in all aspects of of human culture and society, so kind of counterintuitive, but I'm I'm reassured by the fact that bad times create good men. So you're an optimist. That's fucking awesome. Sort of. I'm a pessimistic optimist. Okay. Well, well that's, that that'll work. Shane, man, thank you so much. This has been a great way to catch up with you, and and a lot of fun, dude. It's been great information. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm going to wave goodbye here before I end the recording.